Grandpa Dennis is turning. I'm all right, cause I'm okay. Doesn't matter if my beard is gray. Just listen, I have something to say. Grandpa Dennis is turning. I'm all right, cause I'm okay. And this old goat has something to say. So just keep learning. For Grandpa Dennis is turning. Watch how I go from this bowl all the way to, to this finished piece. Hello, my name is Dennis Provinsky, and welcome to Grandpa Dennis's Wood Turning Studio. This is the bowl we're working on. In part one, I showed you this bowl without any resin in it, and showed how I put a plastic bag around it, and then I filled it with resin. Unfortunately, a lot of that resin went inside, and now the rice that I put in as a filler, half of it is solidified with resin. In part two, I showed you how I turned down the resin and polished it out so that it looks like this. This is the result of part two. In the final part, I'm going to show how to hollow out the inside, get rid of that rice, and hopefully clean up all of the resin and plastic that's left inside. That's the plan. But I've got something to say. Be brave and have the courage to fail. That's basically the theme of all three parts, is take a risk, Push your skills to the limit. Be brave and do as much as you can and then go an extra mile. Have courage to fail. In other words, don't be afraid of failing because when you fail, you can learn how to do things better and be more successful. However, if you do fail, that gives us an opportunity to change what happened, to fix the failure, and to make it into something even better. So, have courage to fail. Be brave. In today's video, I'm going to go into the whole concept of hollow turning. I've got a specialized tool that I have designed and made especially for that. It's an articulated arm, and I'll be explaining that and showing it in much detail. This is my articulated hollowing system, and I'll explain it to you. Or not. This is an old uh, banjo that I've had for quite some time, and I need two of them in this system. This is the articulated arm concept. This particular piece is just a handle that I welded on. This is about 30 or 40 pounds, and it's extremely heavy for me, uh, and it's coming on and off the lathe uh, quite a few times. Now, here's how this works. These are solid bars, two by two, and I had them notched in by a machine shop, and they drilled out the one-inch holes. I've got a, a bolt going down, a one-inch bolt, all the way through, and it goes into the tool rest. There's a bearing on each side of that, and the bearing is called a thrust bearing. They're relatively inexpensive. There's a thrust bearing here, here, and at the nut on the bottom. Those thrust bearings have to be the right tension. If this is too loose, there's slop and play in there. This will go up and down. If it's too tight, it won't rotate. The same as on this side, the same idea. Now in here is a seamless 
piece of tubing. The seamless tubing is an inch and a quarter on the outside and the inside diameter or measurement is three quarters of an inch. So you can use plain three, quarter, three quarters of an inch steel rods to fit inside the tubing. This particular piece of rod is basically just a handle because you are moving your cutter in and out using this handle. This apparatus is basically the one-way laser pointer system. Here's the rest of the one-way system. Now this gets positioned exactly over top of your cutter. And then you, once it's in place, then you can do some adjustments to make it work better. Here's an example of a cutting bar that's on an extreme. I've just taken three quarter inch steel rod, heated it up and bent it. Now that can be whatever distance you need. All the way out the other end. I've got three set screws holding that in place. The best way to hold stuff like this in place is to have set screws at a 90 degree to each other. I've got another one down here. A tip gets put onto here that's a carbide tip and your laser pointer is situated so that it fits right over top of the pointer or a little bit off depending on how thick you want to make it. So in a nutshell, that's the process. My other tool rest sits right in here where my arm is and that gives support for the tip and the cutting. This tool rest or banjo as it's called, can be moved anywhere along the length of the lathe and it supports this. So here's the principle behind it. This is one of the original ways of hollowing. Your arm goes in there and the cutter is at this end. One of the problems with this is if you get a catch here, it will twist the cutter and your arm gets twisted. Unless your lathe stalls out, if it's powerful, as mine is, it'll keep going. This is three quarter inch steel. Unlikely that that's going to break. This is solid bone. Uh, and is likely going to break. This is quite a dangerous kind of tool, and hollowing freehand has always been a bit tricky and dangerous. You have to be extremely careful with that. The idea is putting your curved tool inside so that you can get into the this part of the bowl, and it's on an angle in there. Now, to keep catches from tearing your tool in your hand and wrecking up your muscles, tendons, and bones, this tool comes in. You can very easily rotate inside the piece, and if it catches, that won't happen because you've got these secured down. So any catch will not move. And these are relatively stable 
and solid. And you can now rotate this with absolute ease. So let's put this all together on the lathe and I'll demonstrate. I wanted to show you how the system operates in a little clearer fashion. You can see how this can be moved in all kinds of directions. And because of the way it's designed, This part, the articulated arms, can move quite substantially. As well, the banjo can be moved further out or in or on at different angles depending on the type of piece you've got, as well as the length in here could make a difference as well. This piece, which is the laser pointer, will follow exactly as There's the red mark. It goes along with the tip. Now the distance in here was fairly substantial. We're talking about six inches. So the bar was probably about seven inches of overhang, which is quite significant. Uh, and yet it held together quite well. So that's, in a nutshell, uh, this piece. They can be made. There's a lot of different companies out there that are making articulated arms, uh, so uh, they could be purchased as well. I've put the piece back on the lathe. I've put a bit the Forrester bit in my in the chuck that's attached to my tailstock and I'm okay. <laughs> So I've turned all the way through the rice, and now I'm into the original bottom of the bowl. This is the cutter from Lyle Jameson. You can get it from his website, and it's bolted on to the bar. It's a tiny little carbide cutter in there. That's replaceable. With the laser turned on, I move it until the red dot is a half inch from the cutting tip. When the cutter is inside the bowl, the red dot appears on the outside surface of the bowl. When the red dot drops off the edge, it indicates the cutter is a half inch from the outside of the bowl. Thus, the wall thickness is a half inch. The inside of this piece is pretty rough, especially down in the corner. The bottom isn't too bad, that can be sanded out, but it's awfully rough down in the corner there. That's going to be very, very difficult to sand. Here are a few of the tools I used for sanding the inside. This is basically a bit extender that you can get from any hardware store. And I put my sanding discs into that. 
the set screw locks them in place. That gave me the ability to go deep inside and get the sanding done. Here's another extension that's made specifically for the, uh, the sanding. It's got the Velcro on the top. This comes in, in three different lengths. I started the sanding inside at 40 grit uh, because it was quite rough and uh, ended up at um, approximately 600 grit. After hours and hours and hours of sanding, it's time for the final coat. This finish is one part boiled linseed oil, one part polyurethane, and one part pure tongue oil. The only place I found pure tongue oil right now is Lee Valley. And the technique for putting it on is interesting. You saturate the piece, whether it's furniture or the bowl, as much as you possibly can. And if there's some grain that will absorb more, put more on. After you've soaked it as much as you can, you then rub off as much as you can. And what I have found with a lathe running, you're able to get more off and you're able to build up a little bit of heat, which sets it better. You put some pressure on it as you're turning it. Wow, that's spectacular. Now I've just dulled it up by taking some off. Leave that overnight, come back and do the process again. And between coats, I'll do the buffing with the three the, the brown buffing, triple E buffing compound. The turning and the finishing on this piece is basically done. I put on a final coat uh, yesterday around midnight. It still hasn't firmed up completely yet. So giving the final polish of it uh, will not be a good idea until it, it really cures. But now I have to work out the system and the process of taking it off of this waste block. What I generally do is turn the waste block down as far as I can get it and then take a saw and cut it off. I could continue to turn this down until it has a small little nub, but as you're doing that, it gets to the point where the whole piece can come right off and when it comes off, it either comes off at you or onto the lathe and the ground, which would uh, dent it, scratch it, or even break it. So it is a, uh, a part of the process that has significant risk to it. Um, cutting it off with a saw is probably the safest, but then you have the issue of how do you finish off the bottom. saw jumped and caught me right into the the nail on my thumb you'd think I wouldn't know how to use a saw Jeez.
Boy, that's heavier than I anticipated. Now to tidy up this bottom, I'm gonna reverse turn it. So I'll put it on this way, bring my tailstock up to put pressure on it here and then turn from this side. I found the center of the circle and that will be the center of this as well. Now the trick's gonna be how deep can I cut that out without going through the bottom completely? So before I, st I start, I'm going to measure the distance from here to the bottom on the inside and see how thick that is. That'll tell me how much I've got, how much room I have to cut the bottom out. go any deeper than this. I'm going to take this nub off, grind that, sand it out. It's finally done. Wow, what a long journey. You could say that this was in the works since 1997. That was the date that this was first made. I have to also let you know that when I turned this Caragana root to begin with in 1997, I found a golf ball in the center of it. That is really weird. Now I started the second part of the project, which was doing the resin pour. I started that in May. So this has been a long, long process. It has been somewhat difficult, but as I said before, you have to be brave and you have to have the courage to fail. Well, there were a few failures in here, but I managed to get around them. Beginning of the process, when the resin was solidified and before I put it onto the lathe, this piece was in the neighborhood of 18 pounds. It's now 6.8 eight pounds. The gold in here, which is very difficult to pick up on the on the video, just makes it pop. It really does. And the color in the resin has the white variegated. Very, very nice. The outside diameter here is 12 inches. We're at six and a half inches in height. It's been a great project. It sure took a lot of time and a lot of frustration, but it worked out. If you like this video, please subscribe. Please share it with friends and family and hit the like button. That's gonna help me a lot. I look forward to the next video. We'll see how that works out. Grandpa Dennis is turning. I'm all right, cause I'm okay. Doesn't matter if my beard is gray. Just listen, I have something to say. I'm all right, cause I'm okay. And this old goat has something to say. So just keep learning, for Grandpa Dennis is turning.